Ministry for the Delivery of Crop Protection Agents. Our speaker tonight is, uh, was ori originally in, from and raised in upstate New York, received his BS in biology from Le Moyne College in Syracuse, his MS is in uh, entomology from North Carolina State University, and his PhD is from Cornell. He's done postdoc work at Cornell and at Boyce Thompson Institute. His uh, research background is in implied insect interaction and host plant resistance. He's now working with the uh, Crop Genetics International and Plant Delivery Systems for Insecticides. So I'm very proud to introduce Dr. Michael Dimmick. Thank you, Butch. I really want to say I appreciate, <coughs> excuse me, want to appreciate the chance to come and, and talk to you folks, uh, the invitation by the entomology graduate students. Uh, it's kind of nice to come to a place and, and give a talk on an agricultural topic in a place where people tend to appreciate agricultural subjects more than they do around the Washington and Baltimore area. We get a lot of, I, I understand crop genetics has gotten a lot of press attention out here for our uh, proposed field test that we'll be conducting this summer in, in Nebraska, uh, Illinois, Minnesota, and also some testing, not of uh, our genetically engineered products, but some testing here in Iowa. Uh, we get a lot of attention, a lot of press attention in uh, the Washington area, but it, since that place tends to be crawling with lawyers and environmentalists and such, the, the, uh, the tone of the newspaper articles tends to be a little different. So, uh, I'm, as, as Butch said, I'm, I'm an entomologist, and I don't want to disappoint somebody who uh, came expecting a, a molecular biology talk because I'm definitely not a molecular biologist, but I'm, I've been spending the last year and a half with crop genetics immersed in, in the world of molecular genetics as applied to crop protection, and it's kind of hard not to absorb a few things. And so I think what I can give you here tonight is kind of an, an entomologist's eye view of what's going on in, in this world, particularly with CGI. And start out by saying that, at least from, from an entomologist's point of view, uh, from my point of view, the state of the, the various arts of genetic engineering is such that the insertion of foreign genes into plants or micro, microorganisms appears to be less difficult than actually finding useful genes to insert. Uh, the transformation techniques that, that these people use nowadays appear to be sufficiently well developed to allow direct manipulation of most direct genetic manipulation of most major crops, at least on an experimental scale. Uh, the problem from where I sit <coughs> seems to be finding stable, desirable traits such as resistance to pests that are actually controlled by only one or two genes and identifying those genes that are responsible for those desirable traits. So it's not so much a pro problem of the process of putting these things in as finding the raw material and identifying the raw material with which to, to do these, these sorts of things. Uh, the search for this reason is concentrated on microbial metabolites, particularly those of soil-dwelling microorganisms. The genetics of these organisms is relatively simple. Bacteria, for example, have a relatively small genome consisting of a single chromosome and, and various plasmids, or small circular DNA molecules. Many of these organisms produce chemical toxins to ward off competitors or predators or to, to kill their own prey. Uh, so. Genetic engineers aiming to, to endow crop plants with resistance to pests have paid particular attention to, to these groups of organisms and, organisms, and particularly Bacillus thuringiensis, or Bt, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. If I could have the first slide, please, and the lights. Bt is, is the darling nowadays of, of genetic engineers, at least in agricultural crop protection circles. Uh, oops, I got the first slide. It's, it's a common soil bacterium that's been around for, for a long time. Its insecticidal properties have been known since about the turn of the century. Uh, last time I checked, there were about 30 subspecies recognized, hundreds of strains, all with different levels and spectra of activity. And this stuff's been around in commercial use for, for 50 years, over 50 years. It's been used in this country for the last 30 years under various forms. Uh, the reason people like it is because it's of its remarkable environmental safety. It's highly specific to uh, larval Lepidoptera, although there are some strains and some subspecies that have activity against Diptera and or Coleoptera. And there's also a certain amount of specificity within the Lepidoptera and active strains. And also, uh, this stuff doesn't tend to hang around. It's, it is very easily degraded in the environment, which is one strike against it from an efficacy standpoint, but from the environmental safety standpoint, it's a, it's a desirable trait to have. 
this is kind of a, a cartoon view of what happens. Uh, I feel a little nervous talking about this with Les Lewis sitting out here, because he can probably tell you more about this than I can. Uh, late in, in the vegetative stage, late in the, the logarithmic phase of colony growth, the, the uh, vegetative cells of Bt sporulate and produce a spore and also this parasporal crystalline inclusion. And then the cell lice is releasing the spore and the crystal into the environment. That environment can be a, the cadaver of, a, of an infected caterpillar or it can be a fermentation tank at Abbott Labs. Uh, a caterpillar coming along feeding on a, on a contaminated leaf or one that's been sprayed with Dipel if it came from, from Abbott Labs ingests that uh, the spore and the crystal and the uh, crystal is degraded in the alkaline gut of the caterpillar, releases a, a protoxin which is then digested in, in the midgut of the caterpillar, attacks the midgut epithelial cells. <coughs> I won't get too much into uh, the, the actual mechanism uh, in, in this talk. The, uh, this is a scanning EM shot of the crystal. The point I want to make here is that the reason genetic engineers like this, this bee so much is because the, the proteins that go into making those crystals are in most cases controlled by one or two uh, genes that have been cloned, you know, identified, sequenced, cloned. There's a lot of uh, genetic libraries out there. People have identified the genes responsible for producing these toxins. So there's a, a lot of excitement in commercial genetic engineering of BT nowadays, and there are a lot of different approaches. I've kind of divided them up in, into two general uh, applications or approaches, the first being external application, where people like, like Ecogen in Pennsylvania are trying to produce more toxic strains or strains that have a broader spectrum of activity. Uh, for instance, they have a, a BT product now that uh, called FOIL that is a just a product made by natural conjugation, a conjugation product. There's no recombinant DNA technology involved at all. It's a BT that produces toxins that are active against Lepidoptera as well as Coleoptera, and they're marketing right now uh, a product for Colorado potato beetle and uh, uh, European corn borer control on potatoes. So what they've done is increase the spectrum of activity of that of, of one particular isolate through uh, through bacterial conjugation. Uh, you've got people like Mycogen working on improved persistence with their a product they're working on called MCAP, which is basically a, a, the BT toxin encapsulated in a dead bacterium uh, as a way of reducing the UV degradation of this thing when it's applied to the external surface of a plant. And then we have uh, plants as delivery systems. Everybody's heard about the transgenic plant work that's being done at places like Monsanto, uh, plant genetic systems in, in Belgium and several other places where BT genes are actually being inserted directly into the genome of the, the plants, tobacco and tomato, and there's some work on cotton. Uh, and then these things are, are rendered resistant to the, the pest insects, the target insects. In most cases, it's, it's caterpillars. Uh, Monsanto has been doing some work. Uh, I think they've scaled back on it somewhat, and I think there are a few other people working on epiphytic microorganisms, uh, particularly the ones that colonize the root systems of some plants as a means for delivering uh, toxins, whether they be BT toxins or other microbial metabolites. And then down here at the end, you've got uh, endophytes. And endophytes, if, if we want to give it a broad definition, can, can just be called microorganisms that live within the tissues of their host plants. Now that's a pretty broad definition and plant microbiologists tend to to distinguish between the pathogenic and, and parasitic microorganisms that inhabit plants and those that are either mutualistic or, or commensal with their host plants. Uh, of course most of the study in this in, in plant microbiology has concentrated on pathogens. Uh, in, in most cases in the past if, if a bacterium doesn't do anything to its host plant, nobody's bothered to, to look at it. Nobody, you know, nobody would fund research on uh, a bacterium that doesn't do anything to the host plant. However, there's been a lot of interest in endophytes and in, in plant herbivore inter interactions, particularly from the uh, people who work with these fungi. There are a couple of species of fungi that have attracted attention in recent years because they produce uh, metabolites alkaloids in particular that protect or appear to protect their host plants from either grazing herbivores, grazing mammals, or uh, in some cases they've been shown to have effects on insects. Well, 
there are also a whole slew of bacterial endophytes that either show up in plant tissue culture as uh, contaminants or have been isolated by various means from host plants that have been pretty much ignored. But uh, around about 1981 or so, uh, this man, Dr. Peter Carlson, who's a co-founder and chief scientist at Crop Genetics, realized that these things presented a tremendous opportunity. Uh, here was something that was sitting there not having any effect on the host plant. It might be something that through genetic engineering we could use to deliver uh, molecules of, of gene products of interest. Uh, he co-founded uh, Crop Genetics International, which is based in Maryland. Uh, and the company is developing a family of, of bio -eng genetically engineered bio pesticides under the trade name Inside. Uh, give you a uh, kind of a capsule summary of, of the components of Inside and how this thing will work. You take a naturally occurring gene, in this case, what? is that reasonably in focus? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll stop playing with this thing because I don't think it's working very well. In this case, we're talking about BT. Uh, there are other gene sources out there, and there are plenty of gene jockeys who can manufacture uh, analogs, of, if you will, of, of genes. But the idea is to take a gene, insert it into an endophyte, and have that endophyte colonize a host plant and produce a product, and in this case, BT. Uh, the way we intend to deliver this is through seed inoculation. Uh, we're, we've got part of our proprietary technology right now is uh, a vacuum, or not a vacuum, a pressure differential technique, whereby the endophyte is forced into whatever openings it can get into the seed. Uh, in fact, one of the things we'll be testing this summer in our field test is the, the seed inoculation technology on a, on a larger scale than we have been in the past. Uh, essentially, you bathe the seed in a, in a suspension of the bacteria, apply a, a pressure differential. This can be done either by vacuum infiltration or pressure infiltration, and it forces the, the bacteria in through whatever openings, uh, cracks due to drying up through the pedicel of the seed, and it results in colonization of the seed, and as the embryo grows, it itself is colonized by the, by the endophyte. Like I said, this will be produced and, and marketed through seed companies as a seed inoculation, a seed inoculant. Uh, we're co cooperating this summer with several seed companies, which I'll, I'll list toward the end of the talk. Uh, The idea is that we'll come up with an inside treatment facility or, or a piece of equipment that will be able to fit right into the line at a conditioning plant. Somewhere, I've been told, probably between the, the sizing operations and the chemical treatment where they, they uh, apply all their antifungal and, in some cases, insecticides to uh, cut down on, on storage loss. So the, the, pro the goal here is to come up with a piece of equipment that will fit right in the line at a seed processing plant. We're currently working on, right now we've got this on, on a research size scale. Uh, we're cooperating with, with seed companies in, in coming up with the equipment we need to put this into a larger scale and fit it right into their, their line. So the components, the, the sort of three technologies involved here are the genetically, genetic engineering of an endophyte to produce a gene product of interest the seed inoculation, and then what we've been kind of calling plant vaccination. It's more of an analogy. Of course, plants don't have immune systems, so it's not a totally accurate analogy, but, uh, but to, to uh, less technical audiences, this gets presented as a, as a plant vaccine. We're producing the first plant vaccine. The idea is then that the endophyte colonizes the, the plant as it usually would and produces the gene product, and then an insect, in this case, a lepidopteran that comes and feeds on that that uh, plant gets the, the uh, BT punch here. So <laughs> this, this is a good way. If, you, if you're trying to explain how BT works to a group of uh, potential investors or uh, Madison Avenue types, they, they don't want to hear about mid-gut epithelium and all that. This, they, they know what ulcers are, and so this, this kind of helps them figure it out. But you can, you can probably guess here that we're not talking about just insecticide delivery. Uh, the key point is we're talking about a delivery system. 
uh, inside is, is just that, a delivery system. We're first developing it with the BT as an insecticide. There are other, other sorts of genes out there that uh, could be delivered by this sort of, this sort of system. Uh, we've been talking with people about, I mean, there's a lot of excitement about things like neuropeptides, uh, other microbial metabolites that have insecticidal activity. Fungicides would be a, a real, real big market. We have some people who are exploring that option. And also, also uh, growth enhancers are, we don't really like to use the term plant growth regulators because what we're talking about is low molecular weight compounds that, that appear to have enhancing effects on growth. We're a little uh, hesitant now to, to say that we're going to get into uh, plant endocrinology, as you will. We're not really thinking about delivering things like auxins and gibberellins and that sort of thing. Uh, more things like simple simple compounds, amino acids, and things that might have enhancing effects on plant growth. Again, a delivery system. The organism that we're, we're starting out with here is, is a, a bacterium known as Clavibacter xylei, subspecies Cynodontis, which I'll be referring to as CXC. Uh, this is a, <coughs> excuse me, a, a uh, fastidious carinoform bacterium that is very closely related to uh, another species that was isolated from sugarcane that causes ratoon stunt in sugarcane. Although this particular subspecies is not a plant pathogen, it's very closely related, which leads to some sticky problems with uh, getting aphis permits to ship this thing around, because aphis considers this a plant pathogen. So, uh, well, I'll show you here. The natural host of this thing is Bermuda grass. It's found virtually anywhere Bermuda grass grows. <coughs> now, where, where we run into problems with aphis is that if, if you wanted to take a truckload of Bermuda grass that might be loaded with this organism and ship it from Tifton, Georgia to, uh, you know, Minneapolis or something like that, no problem. But if we wanted to take a, uh, a test tube full of CXC, the same route, we need permits up to here. So th this is uh, a real education in, in the regulatory process as we go along here. Anyway, Bermuda grass is the naturally occurring host of this this beast. It can be experimentally inoculated by injection into a, quite a wide range of, of uh, other plants. This is a list of just economically important uh, crop species that have been tried as, as hosts. You can see that corn is a good host, rice and sorghum are very good hosts. We've got some other major crops that are fair hosts and some, some other groups that are not colonized at all. Um, not noticeably, uh, crucifers are not colonized. Umbellifers are not very well colonized. Uh, no woody perennials are colonized at all. <clears throat> now, I want to point out that we're talking about injecting this thing with a needle directly into the plants. These things, you won't find them colonized in the field unless we've, we've inoculated them. There are also some wild uh, plants, some weeds that are experimental hosts, and at certain times, if you find them growing in close proximity to colonized Bermuda grass that has been mowed repeatedly, you can find it in these hosts, and I'll be getting into a little later some environmental studies that we've done to look at transmission of this thing in, in the field. Because one question is, okay, we inoculate it into a, the target crop. Is it going to get out of that target crop? Well, anyway, once we inject it into these, into these hosts, it colonizes the xylem. Uh, it doesn't occur anywhere in the plant except where there's xylem. So there's no colonization of seeds or silks in the case of, of corn plants or pollen but you'll find it in the leaves, in the stems, the roots, husks, uh, any place there, there's xylem. This is a scanning electron micrograph of the inside of a xylem element, and you can see the rod-shaped bacteria here. They tend to be a little sticky and stick end-to-end, -end, so it has this very characteristic elongated shape. This is our first target. I don't think this guy needs any introduction around here, European corn borer. Uh, the next slide is kind of our marketing department's dream, the $80 million <laughs> inside market. Uh, you know, this, this is uh, our, our marketing vice president likes to tell people, well, this, this is where you're going to see inside varieties used in, uh, when, it, when we release it. I, I think we all know that we're probably not going to see that for a while anyway. And also there's a, a pretty large market for this sort of thing in France. France has a significant European corn borer problem in its primary corn growing regions. Uh, in fact, CGI has a rather close research uh, arrangement with INRA, which is the French equivalent of the ARS. Uh, 
we have funded some research over there, and we have a couple of scientists over there who are working on the biology of the, the bacterium in, in France. The occurrence of it. Well, genetic engineering, that's what it's all about, and that's what everybody wants to see slides of. Uh, it comes down to genetic engineers. What I've learned in the last year or so is genetic engineers spend most of their time looking at plates and about that much time actually splicing genes. So uh, like the rest of us, the, the glamour is what catches attention, but the drudgery is, is, is there. What we're talking about here, though, is genetic engineering of CXC. An uh, important point is CGI is not a BT genetic shop. Uh, we're interested in genetic engineering of the delivery system. We, we let other people go out and identify the BT genes or other genes, and we go to them and say, we've got a delivery system. And I think that's one of our strengths is we don't have a lot of people uh, getting us into genetic engineering of, of the actual toxins we want to deliver. What we're doing is getting them into the, into the end of fight. Uh, this is just a kind of comparison. This is BT over here on the left. The way the engineering is done is they, they take the gene out of, uh, it's actually a Christaki, BT Christaki HD73, and do the transformations in E. coli, and then take using vectors, they take those things out and insert the, the genes into CXC. And these are all taken at the same magnification. So you can see we're dealing with very small bacterium here. It's also a very slow-growing bacterium. Uh, one of the another challenge we have is the doubling time on this thing is only about it's it's up to about eight hours. So uh, you streak out your plates, and it can take seven to eight days before you are able to come back and read your plates. So that that's uh, sort of a limitation on the whole thing. Well, if you look at BT, the toxin genes are are contained on these plasmids, just cir circular molecules of DNA. And the, the toxin coding region on this hypothetical uh, BT, or let's, let's call it HD73, is preceded by a promoter, which controls transcription, it's, and then a ribosome binding site, which is an initiation site for translation. What, what we're doing, what molecular geneticists at CGI are doing, is taking out a truncated version of this toxin coding region and inserting it directly into the chromosome of CXC. CXC has no plasmids. All it has is a, a single long strand of DNA that forms a, a chromosome, is broadly defined. And this truncated toxin coding region is fused to an antibiotic resistance marker. In this case, it's resistance to canamycin that allows us to track this thing, to use selective media to, to isolate it both in the laboratory and also in, uh, in greenhouse and, and field studies. So what, what this thing is doing is producing just the active fragment of that crystal protein. It's not, CXC does not produce... The, uh, the crystal toxin itself. It doesn't even produce the protoxin. This particular version produces just an, the activated toxin plus whatever uh, junk tags along from the canamycin gene. Well, going on from the genetic engineering, or at least the cartoon version of the genetic engineering that you're going to get from an entomologist, I'd like to just talk a little bit about how we screen new CXC slash BT constructions. Uh, these things go into a, a standard diet bioassay where we just mix it with, with BioServe European corn borer diet. One challenge we have though is we're talking about very, very small amounts of material. Uh, these things don't come out of a fermentation tank. At the most we should put them in 500 milliliter shake flasks and then uh, mix them. We, we've kind of settled for a while on using these tissue culture multi-well plates because we could do all our mixing and everything right in there, just inject the bacterium in, stir it around with a, with a sterile toothpick and then infest the diet. Uh, we've done some modification of this. We've gone to using uh, little diet cups for, for some of our studies. But the, the approach is generally the same. They, they get mixed into the, the diet and uh, then infested with neonate corn borers. And the rate that we're giving them, we get results like this. If we carry them on, usually for our screenings, we carry them on only for about four days. And then we measure growth reduction as well as any mortality. But if we carry these things out a little farther, uh, these are the kind of long-term effects we get. MD69A is a wild-type strain of CXC. CG525 is a recombinant, the genetics of which I just, just showed you. Uh, the low rate here is uh, 5 times 10 to the ninth CFUs, colony-forming units, per gram of diet. The high rate is 1 times 10 to the tenth. 
those levels are a little bit higher than what we normally find in colonized plants, plants that have been injected with the endophyte. However, they're not totally outlandish. They're higher than the average levels, but we do see occasional levels that high. And I'll, you'll find out why we're using a little bit higher rates than, than the current plant in a minute here. Uh, what I just want to show you here is that we do, this thing is producing insecticidal protein. Uh, the molecular genetis, geneticists will run uh, gel electrophoresis on, on these things and they can identify BT proteins, but then the, the proof of the pudding here is that when we mix them in the diets, we actually do get, at least at the high rate, we get significant mortality among the larvae. Uh, I'll be talking a little more on these results, these sorts of results tomorrow in terms of growth rates, uh, larval durations, pupil weights, things like that, some of the, the chronic effects that we see. Anyway, anything that looks good in a, in a diet screening assay, we take up to the greenhouse, and we've played around with a lot of different uh, vaccination, if you will, techniques, and also infestation techniques. Here we're using little clip-on cages to put uh, corn borers on. Uh, we've done a lot of these things like drilling holes in corn stalks and putting corn borers in, using mi Eppendorf microcentrifuge tubes and jamming them into the stalk. And we, what it all c comes down to is it's, it's better just to go up there and use a bazooka and dump them in the world, <laughs> like like everybody else told us to begin with that we should be doing. So, uh, anyway, anything that looks significant in that screening assay goes up into a state-of-the-art containment greenhouse that we have on our roof in Maryland and gets tested in plants. To date, we have not seen any in-plant efficacy. Uh, the endophytes we're working with now are, are prototype versions of these things, and they're only producing about one-tenth of one percent of their protein is, is recognizable BT protein. And on the one hand, that's been sort of a blessing because that makes EPA breathe a lot easier when we try to take this thing out into the field. But, you know, the attitude is, well, it's not dangerous because it doesn't work anyway. <laughs> but on the, on the other hand, it's enough, it's enough so that we can measure it, measure activity in these diet assays, but it's not high enough to give us activity in the greenhouse yet. Uh, the, the big push this year in the molecular genetics group is to get expression levels up by working with uh, different promoters, different parts of that gene cassette. And the target being this summer, we, we should be able to see pretty soon at least a tenfold increase in expression. Uh, the idea is to get it up there to where it might be something similar to what you see in BT, where uh, it's like a third of the, the weight of a, of a sporulated cell is crystal protein. Uh, it's probably not all that all that outlandish to think. Some of these uh, genetically engineered E. coli that are pumping out human insulin, they produce you know 20, 30 percent of their protein as the product. The thing, the limitation we have to worry about is that we don't want to compromise colonization ability of the thing. So it's, it's kind of a an optimization scheme more than anything else. Anyway, uh, let's talk some about, I'd like to talk for the rest of the session here about field testing of endophyte BT constructions. Uh, CGI wants to do field tests on these things, of course, and there are a lot of hoops you have to jump through to do field releases of recombinant organisms. Uh, regulation of agricultural biotechnology is, is comes under uh, three principal acts, the Federal Plant Pest Act, which is administered by USDA APHIS, <coughs> FIFRA by EPA, and then also TOSCA, the Toxic Substances Control Act. Uh, as I was saying before, we come under the Federal Plant Pest Act because CXC is classified as a plant pest by, by APHIS. Uh, this is uh, just because of its close, well, because of its close relationship with this sugarcane disease and also because in Bermuda grass, there have been reports in the past that CXC can cause a stunting disease under conditions of low light intensity and very high moisture in the greenhouse. When you pull, put those things into normal light levels and, and cut the moisture back somewhat, the stunting symptoms disappear. So there's some discussion as to whether, I think what's happening is that if it grew any faster, if it was a faster growing bacterium, we would be talking about a plant pathogen, but it just doesn't grow fast enough to have any, any kind of pathogenic symptoms other than uh, occasional stunting. Anyway, these are the, the people who regulate field releases of these sorts of things. Uh, the, the field testing of inside has kind of followed this general plan. In 1987, 
summer of 1987, the company conducted extensive field tests with wild-type CXC in Maryland at various locations, looking at the environmental fate and spread of the organism <coughs> excuse me, in corn and in Bermuda grass, the population dynamics of the organism in corn, uh, the effects, if any, that that organism would have on corn, interaction that it might have with pathogens in the corn system, and also just general endophyte biology, getting used to working with this organism. Excuse me. Last year, we got an EUP from EPA, an experimental use permit, to go to the field with a CXC BT recombinant, this prototype construction that I showed you before that, that incorporates the HD73 gene. The objectives were the same as with the wild type, except we also wanted to look at efficacy against European corn borer. We didn't really think, based on our greenhouse results, we would get any, but you know, the test was, was going on. We had very good corn borer populations in Maryland last year at, <coughs> at our our company farm in Ingleside on the eastern shore. We also did a study in conjunction with the USDA ARS in Beltsville involving some of their uh, researchers there, looking at uh, mostly endophyte interactions with uh, soil, <coughs> excuse me, soil dwelling uh, mycorrhizal organisms, uh, phyloplane or microorganisms, things like that. Uh, and this, this summer, 1989, in fact, next week, these studies will be planted. We're going to look at the same CXC-BT recombinant, the prototype, only the main focus is going to be looking at testing our seed inoculation technology. We're doing this in conjunction with several seed corn companies uh, with their hybrids, looking at are these things colonized well by the organism? Will the, the pressure injection technique screw up their, their elite hybrids? Uh, and does the endophyte itself screw up? The, uh, the hybrids at all. Our results from last year seem to indicate that that's not the case, but of course uh, nobody should expect a seed company whose bread and butter is their, the quality of their germplasm to come in and take our word for it, so <coughs> they're, they're uh, going to be testing that this year. Also, we'll be looking at environmental fate and spread on a smaller scale uh, compared to last year and the year before. These, this will be done in three sites in Nebraska, uh, one site in Minnesota, one site in Illinois, uh, our own farm in Maryland, as well as two locations in, in Beltsville with the USDA. But the, the general idea is that 1990, next summer, we'll go to the field with an active strain that will hopefully come out of this, this round of uh, molecular genetics work this summer, where the primary test will be efficacy against European corn borer in these same locations, if not more. Of course, this is right now depends on EPA. Uh, whether they're going to let us take an active strain out or not. That, a lot of that is going to depend on what results we get this year. This is just a slide to show you the sorts of uh, precautions that had to be taken last year with our recombinant release. This is a, a map of the plots we had in Beltsville. The plot was surrounded by woodland. It was kind of a nice isolated spot. We had a, uh, a deer fence six-foot-tall deer fence with uh, barbed wire on top. And then we had a, a fallow zone in here. This area had complete vegetation control, meaning we went in there and just sprayed the living daylights out of it with, uh, with Roundup about every week. And then this fallow zone, we had a zone of trap plants and a dike to, to contain any runoff water. <clears throat> There's another fence here to keep people out. Obviously, we're not going to keep the bacteria in with a chain link fence, but all these dots and dashes are corn and Bermuda grass trap plants, which were monitored on a, on a regular basis for escape from the main plot area. We had a 20-foot buffer here where this was all uh, cultivated. And then these were, were blocks of, of uh, corn plants. And the different blocks are just, some of them were looking at yield effects. Some were USDA studies and CGI studies in Beltsville were, were looking at uh, things like insect transmission of, of CXC, uh, also looking at uh, natural spread of CXC, a couple other things. <clears throat> I mentioned the seed inoculation technology. Well, that wasn't scaled up sufficiently last year that we could use it in the field. We had to go and take little cryotubes full of inoculum suspensions. This is an inverted sewing needle stuck into a probe, a, a dowel, so that the eye would be so it would be uh, would fill up with the su suspension, and then you could stab it into a plant. So we really, really were vaccinating plants in the field last summer. Uh, 
you know, this is the way it's done with just the wild type non-recombinant version where no precautions are taken. Of course, we had to get into all sorts of uh, garb. At least we didn't have to go into the frost band moon suit type approach. I think we had a pretty realistic approach, just disposable suits, rubber booties, and uh, whenever you were working with suspensions of the bacterium, a, a surgical mask to prevent inhalation. There are, this thing has no mammalian toxic toxicity, so in, in some respects, a lot of this is for appearances. Anyway, you can imagine how fun it was inoculating a full cornfield like that. We had a crew out there both here and this is in Beltsville and at our farm in, at Ingleside. Uh, it actually did not take as long as we thought. But this is just to show you what the plot looked like later in the season. Chain link fence, barbed wire. Uh, don't tell EPA, but we had a woodchuck crawling around in here. So uh, it wasn't total containment. But these, this shows you the trap plantings of corn and, and Bermuda grass in here. The idea being that these plants were all sampled periodically for, for uh, CXC, but also these plants were sampled, and they would provide the red, red flag. If CXC was found in any of these trap plants, we'd immediately begin sampling these weeds growing outside the fence. That never happened. Uh, we didn't find anything in these, in these trap plants. But th the main purpose of these tests were to, to see if CXC would fit into what I've listed here as characteristics of a, a good endophyte, something that would be a, an adaptable organ, an organism adaptable to this purpose. Uh, first of all, of course, you'd want something that's not going to kill your host plant or have pathological effects on the host plant. Uh, CXC doesn't produce any visible symptomology when you inject it into corn. In some cases, in about one out of ten of the field trials that we've done in Maryland and, and other places with wild type and recombinant CXC, you do see a significant yield depression of averaging, I think it's around 4 to 6 percent. Again, this is kind of a hit and miss thing. It seems to be, at first we were kind of baffled. It seemed to be associated with certain varieties in certain locations. Last year, uh, what happened in Beltsville is we, we kind of serendipitously found out that it seemed to be associated with soil micronutrient status. And so a big function of the Beltsville test this year is going to be looking at uh, the interaction of CXC and particularly copper seem to be the one. Uh, USDA researchers are going to be looking very closely at that for us. The idea being, well, if, if this thing is a real phenomenon, we're not even sure it's a real phenomenon uh, at this point because, like I say, in 9 out of 10 of those instances, there's no significant difference in, in yield or any other plant characteristics between the inoculated and controlled <coughs> plots. But if it is a real phenomenon, it, it's not a very big one, and it's something that we might be able to take care of by uh, selective addition of, of micronutrients. Uh, so anyway, it, it, at least the thing, it's not like we're injecting stock rot into the, into corn. The second characteristic is we don't want something that's going to persist in the environment and host residue and serve as a, a source of inoculum for subsequent crops or for weeds. Or you, know, you just don't want this thing hanging around, both for environmental reasons but also for economic reasons. I mean, one thing a company wants is repeat sales. You know, we don't want to just sell a farmer a, a soil inoculant that's going to take care of them for the next 20 years. I mean, it's you know, the, the greedy capitalistic approach. But... That's life. <laughs> so a lot of our tests last year were looking at things like persistence in standing stalks. Every week we'd come out and clip a little more off some plants and take it back to the lab, grind it up, plate it out, look for the bacterium. Uh, looked at fallen stalks down laying in, in the rows uh, at various times during the season to, to check for how long it took for the, how long the, the endophyte persisted in that, that debris. Uh, chopped up a whole bunch of, of corn debris and then not just left it, leave it laying on the ground, we disked it in with a rototiller and then came back and, and sampled, you know, this is colonized corn, come back and sample the, the uh, green debris in the soil and also come back and look at volunteer plants coming up to see if colonized green debris could serve as a source of inoculum for the volunteers. This thing here is a runoff collector. We, we would... Uh, after any heavy rainstorm, or since it was kind of dry last year, we'd come in and heavily irrigate these plots, even with a lot of green debris laying on, collect the runoff water in these polyethylene bottles sunk into the ground, and uh, sample that after every major irrigation or rainfall event to look for spread of this thing in, in runoff water. Uh, 
also the persistence of, of you know, and artificially inoculating water samples and then looking at uh, end of pipe populations over time. Uh, I've also inoculated soil columns in these PVC pipe columns and then uh, periodically coming back and sampling survival in the soil. Uh, just to give a capsule summary of the results, looking at persistence of the endophyte in the environment, we couldn't detect this thing beyond one week on leaf surfaces, spraying it on in, in water or buffer right on the leaf surfaces. Uh, two weeks was the limit in field soil. Three weeks in soil incorporated green plant residue. Four weeks in soil in the laboratory. That's above 5 degrees centigrade. At temperatures at or below freezing, uh, what we're doing is preserving the cells. and So they lasted longer. They still showed a, a decline, but they didn't decline as rapidly. Uh, and freezing and, or refrigerating is a very good way of storing these things. After five weeks, it was, in, it was uh, lost in buried sections of corn stalks that were just chopped up and buried in mesh bags. Uh, six weeks was the, the detection limit in, in samples from natural water sources taken from the field, and seven weeks in those standing corn stalks in the field after harvest. It was not detected at all in plants growing in inoculated soil in the greenhouse, even when we ran knives through the flats to injure the, the roots to, to st simulate uh, cultivation damage. This was, uh, you know, the bacterium was poured in the soil, plants grown in the soil, and then the roots cut with knives to, to simulate cultivation damage. Never found colonized plants. Never found it in volunteer plants from the disc under debris of colonized plants in the field, or in irrigation runoff water, or in buried root debris. So what, what this is saying, at least these first two points, an important thing here is that the soil in which inoculated plants are growing in or in which colonized de debris is dissed into can't itself serve as a colonization source or an inoculum source for the subsequent crop. And that's an important point because one, when you start talking about some of these uh, plant pathogenic bacteria, a very important uh, reservoir of these things is plant debris in the soil or on the soil, carrying it over to the, to the next year. And that just doesn't seem to happen. CXC has no dormant phase or no soil cycle. It's totally plant dependent. It can't live for very long outside of the, the vascular tissues of its host plant. Well, another characteristic that we'd like to see is this thing doesn't disperse from inoculated hosts. I alluded a little bit earlier to uh, these trap plants as a sort of a barrier or a detection barrier. We had, not only in the trap plants, but within the plots, we had some special uh, blocks where we had Bermuda grass entwined around the bases of colonized corn plants. The best evidence to date that there's no natural dispersal of this thing is none of these plants were colonized, even though they would twine themselves and the roots would interdigitate. There's just no, no natural dispersal from one plant to another without some kind of external means. Uh, None of these plants, none of these trap plants showed up positive for the endophyte, even though they were extensively damaged by insects, especially flea beetles, but also other insects. And uh, just to go in and confirm or to, to look a little more closely at, at insects as possible vectors, we tested, uh, I think there's actually a couple that aren't on this list, about 10 different species of insects for possible transmission of CXC. And we tended to concentrate mainly in, in insects that are known or related to known vectors of bacterial pathogens in plants, things like flea beetles, cucumber beetles. Uh, the sharpshooter leafhoppers transmit some bacterial, in fact, they're xylem feeders that transmit xylem inhabiting bacteria that cause uh, Stewart's wilt, or not Stewart's wilt, uh, Pierce's disease in grapes. And also we wanted to try a couple of uh, mandibulate insects to see if just the physical damage of a colonized leaf could, if they could just carry enough on their, their mandibles to, to uh, inoculate another plant. I'm not going to show any data for these because it was all negative. Uh, we spent a lot of time with flea beetles and cucumber beetles in particular, moving insects from plant to plant to plant to plant, and never found any colonization of the target plants. However, I'll talk a little bit more about this tomorrow in my entomology department seminar. Corn flea beetles and spotted cucumber beetles can acquire CXC from a colonized plant, which is not that surprising. If you pull them off of a colonized plant, you can find the bacterium in the gut 
of that insect. But we've done very detailed transmission studies with these insects, and they, they don't transmit it. Uh, CXC is not transmitted by seed, either in corn or in Bermuda grass or in the 15 or so other weeds that, that the company has tested to date. As I said, it, it's a xylem inhabitor, and it just doesn't, there doesn't seem to be any, whatever the plant analog of transovarial transmission is, just doesn't seem to occur with this organism. Uh, this is an important point because uh, the fact that the thing doesn't persist in the environment and is not seed transmitted tells us that if it escapes and colonizes an annual weed, that's going to be the end of it right there. Uh, if it colonizes a perennial, we might have somewhat of a, of a persistence problem. However, uh, backing up a little, just to show you the, the technique used to test seed transmission. Take seeds from colonized plants, grow out the progeny, and then assay for, for CXC based on a, a real high-tech assay here. This is what we call squish plating. You just take the, the seedling from that count, the seedling grown from seed taken from a, a mother plant that was colonized, uh, squeeze it with sterilized pliers and squeeze sap out onto uh, a selective medium and then wait for colonies to come up. This is what some of the